Okay, good morning. <clears throat> so, hope hope you all enjoyed the uh, the early spring break. <laughs> you guys okay? Did you have power? We didn't have power. You, your your yeah, dad had some issues, right? Yeah, and then my car is still not working. I gotta fix that after this. And all my parts are back up. Ouch. Yeah. Y'all came in yesterday. So. Okay. I didn't have to go anywhere, which is good, but like. <laughs> <laughs> kind of kind of strange I you know the on I think Wednesday I went out to the grocery store and I was like well the roads are almost you know what the roads I went on were almost all good but I could definitely see how some might not be and the power issue so it's kind of surprising that LC stayed closed through Friday but uh, I guess if there are a lot of people with power issues that makes that makes sense um, so with that in mind there's a, <coughs> a couple things I was gonna ask you all um, and actually you, somebody did ask me if we we're going to move the test back so um, I know that you know that I only gave you about a week for the homework and it was a lot of material to cover and the, the exam was going to be after that so how do you guys feel in terms of um, taking the exam March 2nd is the, the current current schedule which is a week from today um, how do you feel about that? You want to move it? Uh, I keep it. Move it. I didn't yeah. know that I was supposed to four days. Oof. And then so this weekend I was kind of catching up on some stuff that I hadn't even really gotten back to homework yet. Right. And the evening I was supposed to homework yet. Okay. Yeah. So any objections to moving it back? Uh, I mean, I'm kind of flexible. Like we could just move it back a full week. Um, I'll say yeah, do that. We'll do okay. that. Okay, so for the four of you, sounds like we're, we're okay with that, and then for the other two in the class, I'll I'll send out an email, um, or maybe they're watching online, um, but that'll be my plan: is bump it back a week, um, and then uh, so I'll update the syllabus again. Um, I'll probably keep keep to the materials that are on the homework, so nothing today will be on this exam. Um, so. We'll, we'll, we'll be working on membrane filtration today, um, but I'll keep the membrane stuff off of the uh, off of this exam unless it's like dealing with charged particle kind of stuff that we already we already dealt with. So, um, and just just to reiterate, I'm planning to bump the exam back by a week. Um, does that sound all right for you? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna update the syllabus. I will um, again the stuff that's on the homework, and we can talk a little more about it. We'll have s some time to review, um, and I'll uh, I'll go back through and kind of recap the the different topics we have covered and kind of my expectations of them, um, of, of what you know. It's an in class though. Yeah, yeah. This will be in class exam. Um, Plenty of room in here, so no, no uh, problem there. <laughs> well, there's one of the exams I've had so far. I've been taking all of them. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So if that's if that's good, that's what we'll do. Um, so unless unless our uh, sixth class member has any issues, we'll uh, um, we'll have it a week from. So that should be March 9th instead of second. That also means the uh, homework will be due a week later than uh, scheduled. So basically, I'm, I'm having the homework due the class period before the exam so we can kind of go over it, talk about it as a review, and go through the solutions and things like that. So what, like the fourth? Yeah, I think that's correct. So yeah. The sixth is that Friday, that Saturday. Yeah, that's the fourth. Didn't they come out with all my makeup? Yeah, so th what they did to make up for our class that we missed was they said, you no longer get March break, which was March 25th. Okay. Um, so I, I updated the, the syllabus to, like the schedule and the syllabus to reflect that. 
I just shifted the classes around a little bit. Shouldn't shouldn't have too much of an impact. Okay, so with that, um, and then also, it, you know, I, the um, the review assignment was due on last Thursday, but we were closed. So obviously, I'm very um, sympathetic if you had issues, and you know, if you're still uh, catching up from all, from the issues last week, I certainly understand. So there's there's no issues there. If you needed to submit it later, part of the timing was just that. Um, I know we're going to have, you know, we have this homework and I didn't want to overlap those too much um, and we'll have another review assignment due uh, in the future. So I just, I didn't want to push everything at the same time for you, but I don't, I also don't mind if, you know, it's, you know, accommodating for, especially for last week. So if there are any questions or issues there, just let me know. Okay. So today we're going to talk about membrane filtration. Um, there's actually two types of filtration we could uh, describe. Um, we're going to primarily focus on membrane. Um, just kind of to be thorough here, I will mention that um, packed bed or granular filtration is um, pretty common as well for water treatment. So if we have water sitting on some sort of a bed of sand, that's that's what we call granular filtration. This actually operates more so on a basis of um, some of the sedimentation type of principles, particle-particle interactions. It allows a lot of surface area for particles to stick, adsorb, impact, sediment, different kind of a combination of different processes in that media. And that, that can give you some decent particle removal. You can incorporate adsorbent materials in particular and take out some of the chemicals. So if you do a granular activated carbon, for example, as part of your um, media, then you can, you can have more than just what we think of as particle filtration. Um, this is not um, size exclusion. So typically the particles that you're aiming to remove are small enough where they could flow through all the pores, but it's just not very probable that they're going to make it through all, all of them and out the other side without sticking to another particle and growing in size or sticking to one of the, the granular media or otherwise being removed. So that's in contrast with our membrane operation, which is um, typically is a size exclusion um, phenomenon where we have some particle and when we pass water through the mesh of the membrane, then that particle ends up sticking on the surface. The water continues through and the particle is stuck. Um, so like a screen porch or something, you know, keeping mosquitoes out. Um, reverse osmosis is a little bit different. Um, it's, you know, so we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll have a, um, a lecture primarily dedicated to that. Um, but reverse osmosis, in, in a way, it has the same principle, but it's, it's more of um, uh, the pressure gradients and the osmotic pressure become a little bit more important in that case. Okay, so membranes. Um, quick little bit about them. Definition is simply a thin, flat um, surface that is in some way permeable, right? So allows some things to go through. So in some sense, you might be able to call this plexiglass thing a membrane that's letting light through. It's thin, it's uh, um, you know, maybe not very pliable in that case, but typically you're going to have sheets that are thin enough that they'll be pliable. Um, and so membrane, generally we're going to use them for, you know, and, and we can think about it in terms of the size of and the scale of stuff that we are removing. Um, so the simplest or the largest pore size, least complicated, least pressure requirement. Um, these will be l large particles that we can remove, sand, silt, things like that. Uh, we can go up a notch and go to bacteria. Um, so you might might call it microfiltration. Um, you know, if we're going to use a membrane, we, we could use granular for large particle removal, but or we could use what we would call a microfiltration. 
membrane. Getting smaller than that, we would want, um, you know, I guess above that we would just call it a, a screen mesh or something. You know, a, it would not even really be considered as a membrane per se. Um, going from that, we would go to ultrafiltration. That's so if microfiltration is on the, you know, somewhere between one and, I don't know, 20 micrometers, ultrafiltration tends to be something like 0.2 to 1 micrometers. And you, as is you typical, these classifications are a little bit um, flexible. You know, you might, you might have some overlap um, just in the way people call, name things. Um, you'd get to nanofiltration when you're, when you're talking about um, stuff in the range of, let's say, nanometers. So one nanometer to, you, know, you could call it point zero 0.02, that would be 20. So if we call this point zero 0.02 micrometers, that's 20 nanometers, right? Um, and in this range, we actually start referring to rather than the, the diameter of these pores being in nanometers or whatever, it's actually more accurate to describe them by the, but wait, by kilodaltons. And kilodaltons is the measurement of the size of molecules that can pass through, or the weight, molecular weight of molecules. So we're, we're talking about getting down to the point where we have large molecular weight molecules, and we're classifying our membranes based on how big of molecules or how small of molecules can make it through. So this ultimately we start talking about kilodaltons. Um, and so that's, that's kind of just another terminology we'll see um, for that purpose. So we'll say size. of molecules excluded. Okay, from there we get desalination, uh, membranes that can perform desalination um, and can remove ions, and that's what we would call reverse osmosis. And those, uh, you know, again, you could probably describe them in the, the Daltons, kilodaltons, but at some point, um, you know, we, we understand that if it's rejecting ions, then it's it's quite small, right? So that's that's getting to a point where it may not even be um, reasonable to think of the system or to to describe the system as having pores in the typical sets, because um, a lot of times what you'll you'll do is you'll describe you know a larger membrane as okay, what's the typical pore size or what's the the um, minimum pore size, so nothing smaller smaller than this we expect to be removed, and nothing larger than this we expect to go through. All right, so we have some nominal pore size that way. Okay, and just um, just one last time, now that uh, you're here, I'm planning to move the exam one week, if that's good for you, and that'll, that'll mean the, um, the, so the exam will be March 9th, and the homework then will be due March 4th. Um, I'm also going to keep the material that we're covering from today on off of exam one. So the, the material that's on the homework, homework one will be on exam one, and then uh, we'll, we'll revisit this stuff. Maybe if we're dealing with some particles, I might, I might toss in a membrane question, but not the computation, just the what do you think the particle interaction, stuff that we learned already, um, you know, maybe, a, maybe a simple concept like that, but not, not the computational. Today we're mostly going to be talking about concept stuff for membranes, um, and we'll, we'll dive into more of the um, calculation equation type stuff next time. Okay, so just a, a brief little history on membranes. Um, we really haven't been using them for a very long time with water treatment. As our technology has improved in terms of our ability to create polymer materials and work with nano, micro scale um, design and 
functionalization. This certainly has been a, an area of a lot of growth in the past half century. So first really be started being used for water treatment about 60 years ago. Um, 30 years ago kind of gained some uh, common use. Um, and uh, really, I think we started mostly with um, treatment for drinking water, and eventually we started developing um, some applications for wastewater as well, including membrane bioreactors, where we have a bioreactor, like an activated sludge chamber, and then instead of following, um, instead of having a, a clarify, or excuse me, a uh, activated sludge system and then taking that into a clarifier to settle our solids. Instead of that system, we would also recycle some of that. Um, you know, our typical treatment train for wastewater activated sludge would look like that, but the membrane bioreactor would have, a, instead of that gravity separation, we just insert membranes into the system and then we'd have a, some membrane manifolds in here and that would be withdrawing the water, the cleaner water, and here we could have a higher concentration of the sludge um, because we weren't worried about the separation, you know, weren't, weren't worried about that in terms of what can we um, sediment out with the clarifier, so we end up with less land area used higher efficiency of treatment because we can have more microbes in here. We don't even have to worry about this recycle line stuff to keep the microbes. We just keep them by separating right there. So membrane bioreactors kind of offer a few advantages at the cost of applying pressure and these um, more expensive me membrane materials up front. So there's higher capital cost for more efficiency in terms of the treatment that treatment levels you can achieve and the land area you use. So it's a bit of a trade-off, but I've been to a couple MBR plants, um, got involved with a couple studies during my, my postdoc where we were taking a look at some of the membrane bioreactor um, effluent. And you'll find these in some cases where there's maybe a, a treatment plant where a, a river is converging and like train tracks near it or something and it's just not a lot of space for that plant to grow um, land area wise without creating new facility somewhere else which doesn't make too much sense and then when the population increases in the area they're like oh well now we need better treatment more treatment capacity but we can't build anywhere m more so what do we do next well you you might convert your activated sludge to a membrane bioreactor so that then you can have that higher um, higher efficiency uh, more more treatment per land area um, setup. So just one example there um, that's becoming more common. Obviously the the expense keeps it from being um, being the the primary um, treatment practice, but it is becoming more and more common to see that for uh, wastewater there. Okay, so a few terms uh, to define here as we get going. Um, and I'm just kind of taking this from the basics for you, probably a review for most, if not all of you. So permeates what we're going to talk about when we're talking about water flowing through the membrane. So whatever permeates it um, gets through the membrane, that's, that's our permeate, or you might call that the treated stream. Uh, your feed is, of course, the, the dirty water or whatever water you're interested in treat, you know, applying to the membrane or applying the membrane to. That's, that's going to be your feed water. And then the, there's a third flow if we're doing a continuous, um, you know, a cross flow type of system, which I'll define in a moment. That third flow would be whatever's rejected. Um, so sometimes we we don't pass all of the water through the membrane, we just pass most of it, and then the remainder that we're gonna send to a waste treatment, that's gonna be our concentrate or retentate. And sometimes we're using the membrane because we want to concentrate as a solution. Maybe we have particles that we wanna work with in the lab, and so, or bacteria or something. We wanna pass the water through the membrane, get rid of most of the water, 
and keep those particles, right? So sometimes that's, that's what we're interested in. If you've ever um, looked at buying orange juice or some other juice and it says uh, from concentrate or not from concentrate, you know, and as a kid, you're probably like, I don't know what that means, but it sounds bad or something. <laughs> well, it probably just means they were taking it through a membrane to keep all the good juicy stuff that you're interested in drinking and then just diluting it back again later. So it's, if it's from concentrate, that just, they just went through that process. So yeah, maybe you lost a couple of the minerals through it because you know, the membrane didn't catch all that, but chances are the stuff that you're interested in is still there. Um, so of course there's other ways to concentrate it, uh, a solution, but that's probably what's, what's going on for the, that's my guess of what's going on for the juice industry. Okay, so for a typical system, we could uh, think of it this way, where we have kind of our feed water with some junk in it uh, going by this membrane, and we see we've got pores where the water can go through. And the particles up here primarily are getting rejected, maybe a few of them, you know, maybe if there was a few smaller ones, they could get through. And so you, you might normally have some distribution of a few particles getting through, but most of them passing, passing along and being rejected and kept in that retentate. So that's, that would be our three um, treatment streams that way. And if I were to draw a box diagram, typically the way I do it is I, I would draw some sort of box and then put a diagonal line through it somewhere and depending on the way I draw that diagonal, we could then label these these different components differently, right? So this, well, this is going to be the feed regardless. Um, pretty much know if we're doing a diagonal, this is going to be the permeate. But the way I've drawn it, what schematically what we're looking at is if the if this guy is the membrane, anything that passes across that membrane is now the permeate. So this guy would also be permeate. and then this would be our retentate. Of course, if I just happen to draw it, you know, the other way with the diagonal from the other side, I would end up having to flip, flip these two, right? The permeate and the retentate, because now, you know, it's just visually one's crossing the border and one's not. Um, so I'm gonna leave it how I had it a minute ago, oh, yeah. So I just wanted to let you know that's, that's um, for drawing box diagrams, that's kind of how it goes. Um, there's no reason to draw all four, you could just draw three. Uh, but another thing I wanted to uh, use this to illustrate here is that simply, it doesn't really matter in our membrane systems where you harvest the water from so long as the water has crossed the membrane. And you'll see this in a lot of our different configurations of membrane housing and setup there's actually a lot of creativity that, um, that you can apply to how you design a membrane system in terms of where you're collecting your feed from, or, or excuse me, where you're collecting your permeate from, or how you're feeding the membrane. So um, geometrically, there's some interesting things we can do, and then we'll, we'll see there's some different places you can harvest from given what's going on. So that, that's a cross-flow filtration system. Um, sometimes we might also use a dead end filtration, um, which is what this box diagram here is showing, where we would have some membrane here, and we're just pushing water through that membrane. This would be like a syringe filter if you've ever done that in the lab, um, where you have, you have your water pushing it through. And essentially, if you, if you end up leaving a little bit of water left, after some time, you push it through and then you still have a little bit of water here. You could keep that water as your concentrate. It's not gonna be a flow, right? Because in the cross flow, we're talking about like the feed flow, the permeate flow, retentate flow. So you could keep some retentate here if you wanted um, and call it that. Um, but that's, you know, that's just the one caveat, right? You still have a feed. While you're applying pressure, you'd have the feed flow and the permeate and then optionally, whatever you kept behind would be your concentrated solution. We'll do a, we'll do a simple problem at the end today 
just kind of looking at um, that dynamic. Um, we don't really need any special formulas or anything. It will just be kind of a simple mass balance, um, just to kind of get a get a feel for what that would mean in practice. Okay, so with two flow regimes here. <coughs> correct that real quick. Um, so I mentioned um, both already. So the this um, syringe filter here, you've very likely seen these. Really just, um, <coughs> we can think of that a, uh, <coughs> a dead end flow as a batch type of system, right? We put in a sample of water and we run that batch by pushing that one batch through the, uh, um, through the syringe. <coughs> So it's similar to our batch reactors in that way where we're, we can only do just one, one bit at a time and it's not very efficient for continuous operation, right? It's great for the lab um, until you need to have that a continuous flow or continuous production of water for a community or whatever. Okay, a uh, couple other, or just another diagram here, kind of another thing you might see in a lab dead end filter here with instead of using applying pressure to the um, to the front or to the um, to the feed you can apply pressure um, using a vacuum so this is a, a vacuum attachment here you you pull the water through and you have a support here for your filter to go on and then you collect your permeate through here. So that's another typical arrangement for um, a membrane system. And what you'll notice here is this membrane support, it's actually kind of a good example of how most membranes are um, created, where you have some rather porous substrate material that's um, much higher porosity than your actual membrane, much higher pore sizes, um, but it's structurally sound. It can hold a flat sheet that's, um, you know, a, a delicate flat sheet membrane. And so that, that structure here, we'll see this in membrane design, a lot of times membranes themselves will be designed with a supporting layer and then the separation layer. And so that's um, kind of a, just a, interesting to take note here because that's um, the same design for larger systems. Okay, uh, cross flow at a, in a lab scale might look something like this where we have some feed water here on the right. This is being withdrawn and pumped through this membrane system. So the, the chamber here is our membrane and this looks to be what we would call an inside out tubular membrane. So the water's, the dirty water is flowing inside of a tube and then being pushed, pressurized to go out. And so it's escaping out and collected. It's a little bit hard to see and actually I might turn this light off here. So the, uh, you can kind of see a, a plexiglass um, container here um, right here. So it's kind of housing, it's housing an outer chamber where water is collecting um, after it's been moved, it goes out of that tube and then it's collected here to the permeate. So that's, that's what's happening here and kind of one simple example of where we're collecting that permeate. Meanwhile, the rest of the, the flow, what's not passing through the membrane, is continuing on through here. We see this valve here. This is likely what's applying the, the pressure, um, not letting much water flow through here or restricting the, the size of the, the flow. So um, the pressure that our pump over here is applying is um, kind of fighting that. And so the water is, some of the water is making it through this permeate, um, but it's also 
applying that pressure um, to go through this um, this membrane. And so then over here, this concentrated water, you know, it, probably a little hard to tell just from this random picture I found online, but essentially that the stuff there should be higher concentration than the stuff on the right. Um, so that's kind of a lab scale picture here. Now, when we put, when we put one of these, a, a membrane system together, there's a few things we might want to consider. Um, a lot of times we'll operate them, uh, like a lot of membranes in parallel. If we need a large volume of water to be treated, then you know, many times we'll apply the water, apply pressure, and you know, our first membranes in line, these are typically going to be our largest pore size membranes, right? So we will start with our um, largest pore size first. So these, just as an example, maybe these would be 0.45 micrometer um, ultrafiltration membranes, we'll say. Then um, after that, we'll take that, that uh, treated water from these and then send that treated water through its, another membrane. And this one maybe would be some nanofiltration membrane. And maybe we'll call that a 0 0.022 micrometers or something. Which, you know, maybe that, maybe some people would classify that still as ultrafiltration. But the point is, what we'd want to do is uh, first treat the majority of our water um, with a, a system that's got larger pore sizes. That'll let us um, more cheaply separate larger particles, and it will protect our uh, more delicate membranes down the process from the large particles that could um, injure the membranes. So this is both um, a, you know, pressure cost, um, so cost of energy. That's one reason we do it. And we, we do it to protect the sensitive and typically more expensive, um, finer membranes. So you might do this with a few processes, maybe before we even get to the 0.45, maybe we use some sort of a screen or um, a five micron membrane of, or something um, to really get you know, sand particles out of the system, anything like that. If we just have, you know, depending on what our source water is like, <clears throat> then we pass all of these through here some fraction of that is wasted, so we don't have as much water to treat after that. So perhaps we have a smaller flow, um, and then that smaller flow goes through this nanofiltration. And perhaps that also has a, a waste and a permeate as well. Um, so one thing to, to keep in mind here is as we're applying pressure to a system like this, we, we have some pressure, P, and what we're interested in, in in a lot of our membrane design and operation, we're gonna, we'll dig into this more next time, but essentially it's the pressure drop from before the membrane to after the membrane. So we, we would have, let's say, pressure zero here, pressure one coming out. You know, the way I drew this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this, these dotted lines with the permeate. So pressure one, and then I'll say, you know, I'll draw this, I'll keep the same uh, configuration. So here we have permeate again. And, you know, as, as you see already, it doesn't really matter which which line I labeled as permeate versus retentate here, and I didn't, I didn't happen to draw the, the diagonal. So if I were to draw the diagonal, then it should, if that's our permeate, um, that's awkward. 
<laughs> but that's going to be like the the one we just saw in the the previous thing, right? So the box box diagram with the diagonal doesn't actually work like it I would have wanted right here, but essentially it's going to work like the uh, that lab scale demonstration we just saw. So where we have the permeates just going straight th or the um, retentates just going straight through and the permeates coming out and being collected. So we're going to continue with that and say this solid line is then waste. or retentate. And here I'm joining the uh, retentate from the nanofiltration and from all the, the microfiltration membranes here. Okay, so if we do that, then we have, we're looking at our pressure drop here. What we'd want to, to say is that the delta P for these membranes would be that essentially the this P0 minus P1, right? So delta P here is P0 minus P1, and the delta P for this membrane would be P, um, P1 minus P2. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because you can apply a whole lot of pressure up front, and the only pressure this particular membrane up here is going to see is whatever that drop is, right? It's you might have a, a membrane that's rated for only so much pressure, um, but if you, if you set up your system properly, then these membranes aren't handling so much pressure and it's just that nanofiltration that needs a lot of pressure. Um, and it's actually applied, it's uh, still feeling that pressure through these membranes, even though they're taking some of it away, it's still, there's still a lot of pressure in these, in these pipes going to that one. So as we think about membrane systems, one thing that goes on is we have um, pressure applied at different places and pressure measurements happening at different places so we have a, a good understanding of um, what's happening with the pressure. A lot of times when people are studying membranes, what they'll track is the pressure and the flow rate. Um, so that those two things give us quite a lot of information about what's happening on the membrane. Is it getting fouled? How badly is it fouled? How, how, much, how much have we restored it back to what we would call brand new um, after some sort of a, tr a cleaning procedure um, and all of that. So those are all quite important. So in terms of those design parameters, I was just mentioning that operational pressure. So that's one of them. Um, operational flux is another big one. And then simply the contaminant size. So when we're de deciding on what type of membrane to use, have to con consider all of these. We need to know, um, in some sense, most applications we have to operate in a constant flux. We need to meet a certain um, flow demand, right? We need to treat a certain amount or we need like a, a dirty water or we need to uh, meet the demand of a city or municipality um, that needs the water. So typically what we'll do is operate in a regime of constant flux, um, meaning we have to change the pressure as needed. So we'll probably be increasing pressure over time, which obviously increases the cost. Um, and while, while treating for whatever contaminant we're aiming for, we need to obviously make sure we're doing that. Okay. So if a few thoughts here. Um, I have a chart from a, not the book that we're using, but a different book. Um, we've, seen, we've seen something like this with the different particle sizes, but essentially um, what I want to draw your attention to is we have these different particle sizes and we have different, um, at the top, there's different separation processes that we can apply. And then the, the pressure required and then kind of the flux um, flux per square meter of um, membrane or separation material that we're dealing with. And then on the bottom, the corresponding stuff that we can actually remove with these procedures. So we'll start the top right, the conventional media filter. That would be our um, granular media, sand, sand filtration type of stuff. We can remove particles anywhere from a little bit higher than one micron to 100 microns or so. 
Um, that's you know some overlap here with microfiltration, so we can certainly design a membrane to do a lot of that. Um, the operating pressure that we might expect for that would be about 10 kilopascals. Um, and a, another way to look at that would be if you consider a typical, typical granular media, you usually have one to two meters of head. Um, and what I mean by that is water stacked that high on top of the, the sand bed. Um, and that hydraulic head is, you know, the, the pressure is that, that weight of it pushing through. So um, for, for example, one meter of head that way is about 9.8 kilopascals. So about one meter. Okay, so obviously, you know, double, you know, maybe 10 to 20 would get you up to two meters. Um, and one kind of neat thing that I've seen, um, seen before was a, a microfiltration setup that was designed for operation, kind of small scale system for developing countries or disaster relief scenarios, um, whereas gravity fed by a 10 meter, um, like a, uh, a tower with a, a water, water container 10 meters up. And that, that could operate a microfiltration, like a pretty good microfiltration, because um, 10 times you know, the one meter here, that puts us right here actually into the point where we're getting ultrafiltration. I, I said microfiltration, I actually meant to say ultrafiltration, but it's you know, kind of on that, on that scale between them. Certainly you can get bacteria and a lot of viruses in that, in that regime. So it's actually quite, quite good treatment just for gravity. And then it was set up so that as long as you could get the water 10 meters up in the air, um, then it's a pretty good system. And so some, sometimes that's reasonable um, maybe you, you still need an external energy input or maybe you're, you're lucky and have a water source and then a hill and, and all that. So there's room for a clever design there. Um, but essentially what that, that particular, I think it was called the sky hydrant. And that particular system you could uh, turn some knobs to allow it to back flush itself with, with the water. Um, again, using the, just the height of the system as, as the pressure. So that's anything uh, stronger than that, you're starting to look at, okay, well, can I put something 100 meters in the air? Not, not so realistic, right? So the, um, that's kind of the limit of, of the pressurization from kind of, I guess, uh, non-pump means. There, there's also a, a cool a bottle system um, called the Lifesaver bottle. Probably seen these. You can pressurize, hand pump, hand pump those, and give apply enough pressure. And that's probably a similar, um, similar type of membrane, similar type of pressure here, uh, where you can get about that pressure by hand, um, and get some uh, ultrafiltration to clean the clean the water in a, in a kind of a small scale system. Okay, so yeah. basically a series of PVC pipes and it had like different, you know, it had like sand, yak, all this stuff like traveled and he would put it in the middle of the river and the pressure from the river would be entering it and that's like where he would get his pressure and he had pipes like going off like with the clean water. Mm -hmm. That's what that just reminded me like the pressure required. Like he didn't have to right. create a head. He just used the pressure from the river because it was going, especially, especially during a flood. It was, right. it was moving really fast. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought that was cool. yeah. That, yeah, that, that is cool. Because, you know, you'd think that, well, it would just flow around it, but there's so much water moving. Yeah, it, was, it was big. It was like a big, it was a mm -hmm. big pipe. Okay. Know, that, yeah. Know, it was like a small thing where you could just go around it. And you had, right. you had enough um, going into it that yeah. it, would, it would produce clean water coming out. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, so certainly something that... I hadn't heard of heard of doing it that way before, but there's there's a lot of cool options and a lot of uh, interesting ways to to apply membranes because simply you just need a, a source to pressurize it because um, you you just need that pressure gap across the membrane 
Um, and in that case, probably sand filtrations kind of work the same way. And then they may have also had a membrane involved as well. I don't know, but it's I just, I the same principle. I remember talking to you on it, and it was just he, he had a couple of things. I think all he had was sand and, and granulated carbon, to be honest. Okay. And it's just he had a long tube of it. It mm -hmm. was really long yeah. instead of, like, um, short. So. Yeah. Cool. And, like, the side, it was getting smaller. Yeah. It went down. So, like, the, the opening was, like, with sand and everything. It was, like, really big. Mm -hmm. And the gap was, like, really small. Nice. So, so it was yeah. like a high, or just pressure with the build. Right. Cool. Very cool. So you can see, you know, just to um, consider what, what types of um, particles you can remove, right? So bacteria, you can get, if you're getting down to below a one micrometer, um, you're pretty much removing all the bacteria. Um, so in that, in that sand and GAC uh, example, you'd, you'd probably be getting some bacteria most of the algae, hopefully a lot of the cysts. So a lot of the, the big pathogens, parasites for sure, um, and of course just the general muddiness and stuff, you get it cleaner. Um, and then your carbon in that case would hopefully take care of more, some of the viruses and whatever else is in there. Um, wouldn't, you know, it still may be a pretty good idea to chlorinate it or whatever, but it would be a lot more drinkable than straight river water regardless. Um, and so if you wanted to, to get rid of viruses with just the membrane, you'd, you'd really be looking at ultrafiltration membranes and getting down to the, to the point where you're getting closer to nanofiltration. Um, so a, a virus that I use in our, in our lab quite often, MS2, it's a bacteriophage, meaning it infects bacteria. Um, it's very commonly studied because it's easy and it's um, just very well documented and it's used pretty often as kind of a, a surrogate for human pathogens like uh, gastrointestinal stuff. So these turns out they're between 20 to 30 nanometers if you were to measure. Um, so fairly small for viruses. Um, and maybe there's a few viruses that are slightly smaller but that's kind of on the lower side. So you, in terms of virus removal what you're looking for is really something um, I mean, it, it shows it right up here, and that would be at 10, 10 micrometer, 10 nanometers plus. Um, should should do it for you. Um, okay, so the last thing here that um, is interesting to take a look at is, you know, we talked about the pressure, how much how much pressure is required to achieve filtration in these different systems, but. The other aspect is how much water you're getting through them. So there's, there's two limitations for the um, small pore sizes. One is higher pressure required, but the second is you're just not getting much flow through them. Uh, you're squeezing all that pressure into it. You know, so if you, if you look at the scale up here where you're doing like one, one meter or so worth of water, you're getting a hydraulic flux of 100 liters per square meter per hour or more. So, um, you know, just that, that measure of what volume of water is passing through a given surface area per time. So, if we take that and look at what happens when we increase the pressure or increase the, uh, decrease the size of particles that can escape, we're getting down to the point where we've got 10 or even just one liter for every square meter for every hour um, produced even though our pressure went up to a thousand kilopascals so it's um, these are inversely related here and that's you're getting quite a small amount of water for high surface area at a high pressure <laughs> right so it's uh, you can see how the cost of desalination for example quickly ramps up um, and becomes become something that you really only want to do if that's your, um, if there's no cheaper alternatives, right? Okay, so a couple different uh, membrane materials that we can use. I've mentioned polymer membranes and uh, you know, one of the reasons why we, we really have not had uh, much in the way of membrane applications before recently is the development of polymer 
um, polymer sciences, polymer materials, and the manipulation and understanding of polymers at kind of a uh, that level of control we need to, to be certain that we have some standardized pore size or some way of uh, manipulating that. Um, the other would be ceramic. So ceramic, we've had ceramics for a very long time and it's it's probable that people have been using ceramic um, materials in some way for filtration, but it would be more like the granular filtration. So you can take ceramic pot filters, for example, and let water seep through them. Um, and more recently, that's been something that's, uh, again, deployed as kind of a point of use treatment in kind of emergency situations. You can have water that's a little cleaner. Maybe you can add some silver to them to help kill bacteria. Um, but the, the, the point being here that um, if you design the ceramics correctly, and we've had ceramics for a long time, you may be able to do some filtration. Now, if you go really high tech, you can actually get really high quality ceramics that um, have a very fine pores, and those are going to be robust in different ways compared to the polymers. So polymers you can't heat treat very much because they'll just melt <laughs> or burn. Uh, ceramics have already been fired in a, a furnace and are heat resistant. So there's certain, certain chemical and heat parameters that you can treat ceramic with um, that you cannot do for polymers. But then again, you can't really bend uh, ceramics, um, but typically you can bend your, your polymers. So there's, there's some trade-offs here. Um, some examples for the polymers, cellulose, PVC, um, PMMA, which is uh, polymethyl methacrylate, so um, stuff probably like this stuff here, um, just in kind of a different form. Um, quite a few others, there's um, probably too many to name, and it's kind of an alphabet soup. Um, but each kind of has their own distinct properties, some differences in um, hydrophobicity, for example. So we'll say different surface properties, and these can become important depending on what you're removing and what you're expecting to be your major fouling agents. Um, so different surface properties. Sometimes you could have charged surfaces. Um, hydrophobicity. And maybe general surface functional groups. Maybe you design a system with uh, functional groups, hoping that those are going to prevent the fouling of stuff. Um, membrane fouling is one of the, the big problems. So if you can control fouling in some way, then you're, you're going to be um, seeing some good improvements. Um, even, even stuff added to prevent bacteria from growing on the foulant material, so bacteria themselves could exist as a foulant because there's other junk collecting there, then they grow and then they're kind of in the way. Um, so that's, that's another, re another type of um, thing that we add stuff uh, to deal with sometimes. Okay, so the the actual form of our membrane applications, um, it really, we can take different approaches. Um, so one would be a flat sheet. So you might think of a piece of paper and if we have a membrane, this is a membrane, which, you know, if I poured water on it, probably some of it would make it through. So I guess this would be fairly close to a cellulose membrane. Um, there's other stuff in here too, but um, it wouldn't make for a great membrane and it would fall apart pretty, pretty quickly, I think. Um, however, this is a flat sheet. It's pliable. It's, uh, this is membrane-like in that regard. So as we see up here, what they've done is they've taken this flat sheet and they've curled it. But not only that, but they've taken multiple ones. So you can, you can consider, you know, if you just had a flat sheet and you had to design a system to hold that flat sheet and let water flow through it, you might end up with a system that looked kind of like this, where you put that sheet there, 
and it's like enclosed in a little box and then you put pressure and then it just goes through. It's one big box for, you know, maybe one square foot of surface area here. Now if you take that and instead of just keeping it flat that way, then you wrap it, then you're really increasing your surface area, getting two membranes, and you're packing them in to a relatively small container compared to to that, right? So we can we can just like geometrically here kind of consider it. Now then the trick is to do the plumbing well, right? And that's that's what I was talking earlier about um, potential for creative um, geometries and plumbing to allow for water to be distributed to both of these membranes and to be collected from both in a way where we're not mixing those two streams, right? So in reality, we'd probably have to have kind of a third sheet of paper in here in the middle that, um, or maybe even a fourth one to allow that collection and the distribution for the, for the water to, so that we're not mixing the, the permeate and the, the feed streams. Um, okay, so with that in mind, let's take a look at this slide and try to make some sense of what's going on. So here we have a membrane module where this is a flat sheet that's been um, that's been wrapped, so a uh, wrapped flat sheet system. We have the feed solution coming in along the side. So this is between those layers, coming in that way. And then the permeate, so the treated water, is coming out either end here. So water is being applied kind of in between these pieces of paper, and then in such a way where it, that cannot go into this this pipe here, this let's say PVC pipe or whatever it is, um, but the water has to get into there once it's gone all the way into the middle here. Okay, so it has to travel in between these pieces of paper through a piece of paper, and then it can wind its way down towards the middle because that winding can keep you know, one sheet apart from the other, and it's winding kind of in these interstitial spaces, or maybe the, maybe the white stuff's the, no, no, it's, we see this, this black grid stuff, that's the, um, the interstitial space, I think, right? This is the permeate collection material. Okay, no, sorry. This is the permeate collection, this is the membrane, and then the, uh, yeah, the grid stuff here is the feed, um, channel spacer. So the feed is coming in here and this is just allowing space for the feed to come in and flow through. Then it passes, so it's coming in the black lines here, then it passes through this gray layer. So I, I think it's going, I think this is the gray layer and it goes into this white layer. And then that white layer is our permeate collection material. So then it follows that white layer into the middle and then we have um, our permeate collected. So, and um, I'll try not to step away from the computer next time because I probably didn't capture the audio very well, but hopefully you guys, uh, if you need to go back, you can hear it. Anyway, so the, the point here is that with this system, you have lots of membrane there, lots of surface area, um, you just have to wrap it well, right? So it's a little bit puzzle-like or you know a maze-like, but you can you can do that. That's pretty common, and then it's just a matter of designing the materials well, so you're not adding resistance in in these uh, the interstitial spaces here. Okay, another application form would be tubular. Here we're taking a look at water flowing from. From, again, from the side here, it's going into the tubes and being pushed outwards. So this is inside out flow regime. We can invert that and apply water the other way and get outside to in. Um, so instead of, we have a tube and we're 
putting water in and it's heading out as it goes. That's inside out. We can flip that and instead do outside in where we have water flowing in from the outside. I guess it will. And then whatever doesn't make it into the tubes is our uh, retentate and whatever does make it into the tubes would be our permeate. Um, so uh, it doesn't matter too much the way we design it, although I will say that if we were to take a look at a membrane and a, a tube like this, it's going to have some thickness and you're going to want to put the membrane, the, the separation layer on the whatever side is receiving the uh, dirty water, right? Because we have, so if we have inside out, we would want the membrane on the separation layer on the inside versus if we had a outside in we would want it on the outer layer and the reason for that is because whenever we have a membrane system like this it's going to be um, it's going to be a one fine separation layer that's that's where all the action is happening and these have the right size pores and this is going to be separated or supported excuse me by a thicker structure that's got bigger pores allows water more easily and so what we do not want to happen is we do not want the that um, support layer to get fouled up so we we want the fouling to happen on at the surface here so that we can rub it off easily because if it gets stuck in all the all that stuff we can still have the separation but if it gets stuck in there, there's no way we're, we're getting that off with a cleaning procedure. It's just stuck into the support. So we do want to design our membranes with that in mind and operate them um, on the, in the correct uh, flow, you know, inside or out versus outside in, but we can make them to do either way, right? So that, that's just, um, again, a, a geometry thing, whatever makes the most sense for the system. And lastly, I'll say, you get a little more surface area if you're doing it outside, right? Because that's you, you, the surface area of a bigger uh, circle there um, compared to doing the inside out. But again, maybe it's not, um, oops, maybe it doesn't always make sense uh, to do it that way. Sorry. Okay, so that in mind, one way we can go one step further um, is to do what we call hollow fiber filtration. This is just, the same thing as the tubular except with lots of them, right? Instead of thick tubes that are, you know, maybe the size of a quarter or some other coin, here we have micro tubes, which are maybe a few milliliter, millimeters um, in diameter. <coughs> and uh, you just have lots of them. So this is pretty common. Um, Again, we run into a little bit of an issue of, okay, well, what happens if one of those fibers breaks? What does that do to your membrane process? <laughs> you know, are you, are you still able to um, confirm that you are separating everything that you're supposed to be separating? Well, not, not so much. So you have to be a little more careful and it's a little more difficult if you do have one of them, a maintenance issue with just one fiber you know, that, that becomes like a, a more involved process and are you going to replace all of these? That's going to be a fair bit of capital. Um, membranes do need to be replaced eventually, but you, you aim to operate them for as long as you can, right? Um, that's generally the best. Okay, likewise, these guys can do outside in or inside out. Um, a lot of times, I mentioned a membrane bioreactor earlier. A lot of times you'll have have them, and it'll be um, like a vacuum applied to one end, and it's just pulling water through these um, mini hollow fibers. Okay, so that's that's about it. I want to take you through a quick example. We really don't need anything fancy here. It's just going to be a kind of a word problem that. Uh, 
tasks us with doing working with a membrane. Um, I have a highlighted percentage here. Sometimes I ask this with like 99.9% .9 removal, um, which is close enough to perfect removal that it kind of simplifies the problem. So consider what that would be like if it was perfect versus you know 65 or whatever here. Um, so I'm just going to write a little note up here. So. So just as a kind of a thought experiment, if you wanted to think about what, what happens if that was changed that way. All right, so I'm going to read this and then uh, give you a couple moments to kind of think about it. A membrane filter is used to concentrate an algae sample for culture analysis in a laboratory. A membrane with a pore size of 0.45 micrometers is used and rejects 65% of the algae. Realistically, it'd probably, probably be much closer to 100% for given the dimensions I gave you. Um, but 65% will be good for illustration here. The filtration cell has a volume of half a liter and can be operated in either cross flow or dead end mode. Initially, the filter is operated in dead end filtration mode. Uh, if the concentration, if the initial concentration of algae is 3.5 times 10 to the fifth cells per liter, and the initial volume is 500 milliliters, what is the concentration of algae in the feed if 450 milliliters of the solution is passed through the membrane? I would say it's likely that most of the challenge of the problem is just simply making sure you draw draw it to make sure you can conceptualize what's happening. So take a couple minutes, work on that.
Sorry about that. Um, got to see me on my 16th birthday there from fishing. All right. Uh, so for this problem, um, essentially what, what we want to do is first make sure we know what's going on with the, with the system, which was we started with half a liter of water, you're filtering, and we uh, removed 450 milliliters of water. We passed that much water through the membrane, meaning that we're left with 0 0.05 liters. I put one too many zeros there. Um, but essentially, we're left with 50 milliliters, right? So if we filtered 450, that leaves us with uh, 50 out of the 500 milliliters. So 0 0.05 zero five liters remaining um, then what we want to find is how many cells did we start with how many cells were removed or were passed through the membrane during filtration and then get a final number of cells that are remaining in our f in our uh, feed that, or I guess our concentrate at that point um, given that uh, there's only 50 milliliters. So that's the process I'm taking. So I started out with saying, okay, well, our, what we're looking for is what's the concentration of the solution uh, of the concentrate here. That's our question. We know our concentration initially was given as 3.5 3 times 10 to the fifth cells per liter. So I said, okay, well, my initial number of cells is gonna be in that half a liter we had some concentration on a liter basis, so I just multiplied those. That should give us the number of cells I had in that half a liter um, amount of water. From there, um, we had, I wanted to find how many cells escaped, and so I said that was gonna be equal to, um, essentially the, um, the 450, milliliters that went through or 0.45 liters that went through 35 percent of those cells in that volume are going to escape um, and i know that because 65 were rejected and did not escape 65 percent. so i did 1 minus 65 0.65 gives me that 0.35 that i added on the end so i multiplied the 0.45 the 0.35 by that 3.5 times 10 to the fifth um, cells per liter. That should give us a value, the liters will cancel, that should give us a value, the number of cells that um, escaped through the membrane. So that was 5.51 5 times 10 to the fourth cells. So I said, all right, well then what's remaining is gonna be what we started with minus what escaped, 1.75 if I did that in my head right. Um, Think so you can uh, double check for me 1.75 times 10 to the fifth cells minus 5.51 times 10 to the fourth cells and again I, I probably should have used the calculator but I think that comes out to 1.19 times 10 to the fourth cells and then I was going to divide that by 0 0.05 liters and that's where I was um, coming back to with the calculator so here we have, let's do 1.19 divided by 0 0.05. So that should be 2.38 times 10 to the fifth. If I've got that right. which doesn't, I think I did that wrong. Should it be 10 to the 6? Six? 6? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, which, yeah, and the, and the reason I um, am seeing that is because this should be concentrating our solution, right? And so my answer, how, you know, when I wasn't quite sure, because I wasn't carrying the, um, the units proper, you know, the, uh, 
times 10 to the fourth, fifth, whatever, um, I noticed that my answer was lower concentration than what we started with, and that should not be possible if we're rejecting over half the cells. <laughs> that should be, should be concentrating, having a concentrating effect here. Okay, so then that would be our, our final answer here. And yeah, if you were to take a look at just changing the percent of how many cells are rejected, if we were rejecting 100% of the cells, then it would be pretty simple, right? It would just be, um, we reduce the volume by a factor of 10, and so we just multiply the concentration by 10, and there you go. All right, I, w I went over time, I apologize. Um, happy to answer any questions if there are, but otherwise we're, uh, we're done for today. Yeah. Okay, so you you were taking the um, you, so the uh huh, and you yeah. When you say removed, are you meaning like the filter rejects them, or you? Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. That. How different was the answer? Because it might be. It might have just been my rounding. I may, I may have rounded differently because I was just doing it kind of on the fly. Because I, I mean that sounds like it's probably correct. Okay. If there's a difference, I would imagine that what I did was accounting for the fact that only 450 milliliters was treated. So the remaining 50 milliliters never saw the membrane, so to speak. Um, so that, that is probably the difference. Whereas you, your system treated, treated it as if all of the solution passed through the membrane and then we resuspended it in in 50 milliliters, which maybe is a, the more realistic way to look at it. I'm not sure. Because in practice, what you do is you'd add a little bit of water as you go to make sure there's still some suspension. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I think that in the answer I gave was why there's a difference, but I'm not sure, like, practically speaking, what would be more accurate. I have to think about that. <laughs> OK, so sorry, I, I'm a little uh, late here.